Welcome to NWATC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh. I'd like to turn it over to Christian Ramers to introduce our guest. Great. Well, it's great to have John Scott. I don't think he really needs much introduction. John has led the effort here at the University of Washington for Project ECHO. And we talked a little bit about how to divide this huge topic up. And what we're going to do is start today with really a general introduction and overview. And stay tuned, we'll have at least one, probably two additional lectures on other aspects of hepatitis C, especially focusing on therapeutics. So, John, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Christian. I think we actually have some cases today that are going to kind of stretch the therapeutic window here, so uh, stay tuned. So this is uh, what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk a little bit about the basics of hepatitis C, just spend a little bit about the, talking about the virology of hepatitis C, and then dive into the epidemiology, how you test for hepatitis C, and finish up with natural history. So first of all, hepatitis C is a single-stranded RNA virus. It's primarily spread through blood, uh, so contaminated blood, and that's sort of a key difference between HIV, which uh, is, uh, at least in the United States here, and spread mostly by sexual activity. There's both an acute and a chronic form. And hepatitis C is, is a tricky virus because a lot of times patients get infected and they never know they have it. So it's been nicknamed the stealth virus for that reason. Only about uh, 10 or 20% of the people actually have symptoms uh, when they have hepatitis C. And once you get hepatitis C, the chronic form can have occasional flares. Usually those are asymptomatic, but sometimes may show up on LFT abnormalities. The most common way that patients are diagnosed is through a blood test. Uh, there's a astute clinician who knows about the risk factors or is following LFTs, and that's how it's uh, frequently picked up. So hepatitis C, as I said, is spread primarily through blood exposures. So in my clinic, I'd say it's around 80 or 90 percent have at least one exposure of injection drug use. And it can be sometimes one or two, just simply one or two exposures many, many years ago. A common comment that I get is that, well, I never shared needles. And the, the follow-up question I ask them is, well, did you ever share a paraphernalia? And universally, they say, yes, I, I shared cookers or I shared um, the, the cotton, some part, part of the paraphernalia. And that is, is a common way that hepatitis C is spread, not just the needles, but the other paraphernalia. Blood transfusions, especially before 1992 when we had the, the uh, first screening assay, is one way that patients can get hepatitis C. Occupational exposure, sadly, even here in 2012, um, every year I have a colleague who had a needle stick or um, a trauma surgeon who had exposed to hepatitis C that way. And then unsanitary tattoos is some, sometimes a way that patients can get hepatitis C. And I just wanted to make sure that if your patients are going to get a tattoo, that they go to a reputable salon that not only sterilizes the needle, but they don't reuse the ink, okay? And I think a lot of the tattoo parlors know to sterilize their needles, but sometimes they're reusing the ink, and that's uh, been documented as a way to get hepatitis C. For those of you who work in corrections, um, there have been documented cases of hep C spread through fights, you know, when there's a blood exposure that way, too. So sexual exposure does occur. Uh, it's pretty rare in my experience. Mother-to-child transmission also does occur around 5% of the time, so much lower than HIV. And then the last uh, kind of epidemiologic uh, point I want to make is that this is a disease that really affects ethnic and racial minorities. So there's much higher rates of hepatitis C, and particularly in African Americans, but also in Alaska Natives and uh, uh, Native Americans, as well as Latinos. So there, there have been uh, several reports documenting sexual transmission of hepatitis C. And one thing I just wanted to point out, this, this is a lot of these reports have been in um, HIV-positive men. The first report, I think, was in Europe and, and the Netherlands, and then subsequent reports in, in Great Britain and then also here in the United States. And the, the kind of common denominators in all these reports is that um, a lot of times there was a methamphetamine involved, and there also uh, the highest risk was in receptive anal intercourse. So there's some kind of a um, traumatic mucosal exposure. So hepatitis C is, is a pretty common uh, infection globally. It's estimated around 200 or approaching 200 million persons in the, in the world who have uh, hepatitis C. And it tends to be clustered in those areas of the world where there's a lot of HIV as well. So if you look at this map and the uh, map of Africa and in Southeast Asia, you see uh, those areas in blue and red are uh, the higher endemic regions. And of all those places, actually Egypt has the highest seroprevalence of around 14 percent. 
that is a sad case where there was a nosocomial <coughs> transmission. The health ministry two decades ago was trying to get rid of schistosomiasis, and so they lined large portions of the population up and gave them injections to get rid of the schistosomiasis, but they didn't clean their needles properly in between the injections, and so many people in Egypt got uh, hepatitis C that way. It tends to be genotype 4. And I think the sad thing about Egypt is it continues to be a nosocomial spread, so um, they don't dispose of their medical waste properly there. So still 60% of the infections, the new infections in Egypt are from nosocomial. Other places I wanted to comment on is Mongolia, um, and this is an area where there's a lot of hepatitis B and he hepatitis D as well. So I have several patients there. The last area I wanted to highlight uh, that might be relevant for the Pacific Northwest is Southeast Asia. So about 10% of my patients come from Vietnam or Southeast Asia. There's a, a very high prevalence there. But uh, you can see the United States is actually considered a lower prevalence when compared to the rest of the world. So next I wanted to talk about um, the age groups that are most susceptible or are most likely to have hepatitis C, and it's really the baby boomers. So if you were born between 1945 and 1965, then uh, the chance of having hepatitis C is much higher than the general population, which is around 2%, and it's approaching 5% um, in certain ethnic groups. So I think a lot of that was driven by uh, experimentation with drugs in the late 60s and early 70s. So two th if you look at the whole United States population, two-thirds of the people who have hep C were born between those, uh, those years, 1945 to 1964. So based on that information, the CDC made a revised screening guidelines. And this is hot off the presses literally just about six weeks ago. And this is a letter that was sent out to um, all doc doctors in the United States, and it said that uh, your patients who are born between 1945 and 1965 should get at least a one test for hepatitis C. Uh, and they go on to rationalize uh, why that is. But there have been at least three cost effectiveness analysis showing that this is cost effective. So, what about HIV and hepatitis C co infection? And I think a really key point is that it really depends on your local population. I think in the Madison Clinic, it's around 21% of, of the patients there here in, here in Seattle uh, will also have hepatitis C. Um, if you look in Europe and North America, it's, it's a little bit higher, maybe one, one third. If you look at the flip, flip side, so of those patients who have hep C, 10% have HIV. So um, the standard thing that we do in the hepatitis liver clinic is everyone needs to have an HIV test. And I've picked up at least three or four cases mm -hmm. of HIV that way. And it really depends on your risk factors, though. Um, obviously, those folks have uh, been exposed to a lot of blood products, uh, hemophiliacs, the, the Seroprevalence, I mean, co-infection is 90%, injection drug users 70 90%, and even MSM it's uh, 5 to 10%. So this is data from the Johns Hopkins cohorts in, in Baltimore. I think it's about 10 years old, so it's fairly old, but uh, this shows that 45% of the HIV patients seen at Johns Hopkins also had hepatitis C. If you were an injection drug user, it was 85%, heterosexual 14%, and MSM it was around 10%. So that you should know there's a little bit of difference on co-infection rates on the East Coast versus West Coast. So this is not uncommon to have co-infection rates of, of 30 to 40 percent on the East Coast. It's a little bit lower. You look at San Francisco, San Diego, they're also right around where we are in Seattle, around 20 percent. In terms of workup, the first test you want to do is a hepatitis C antibody. I think they're now up to the fourth generation. These are very sensitive and very specific. The key thing is that it shows whether a person has been exposed to hepatitis C. It doesn't show they're actually infected. The other key thing is that the presence of the antibody does not confer immunity. So you need to do a confirmatory test. We usually don't do the REBA in the way that you do with a, um, HIV. You do go straight to a viral load. And this actually, if it's positive, shows there's active infection. Um, I typically recommend just go to the real-time PCR because it's just as sensitive as the qualitative. Uh, and the same price, so it just kind of simplifies things. And then the next test that uh, sometimes is ordered is a genotype. Now, this is a more expensive test, and what it tells you is more how likely a patient is to respond to treatment. So um, you don't necessarily need to do the genotype right away, <clears throat> only if you're considering treatment. So th this is uh, a slide showing the time course of hepatitis C infection, and this is a patient who becomes chronically infected. So to kind of take you through this graph here, a patient who gets infected will have a pretty high viral load. Um, just like in HIV, you can have very, very high viral loads. 
and that will be the first sign of infection. Usually within a week, your PCR will be positive. And it can then go through a somewhat funny course where it goes down to a lower level and sometimes can even go down to undetectable and then pop back up to being positive. So you can kind of have this battle between the virus and the host. But eventually, most people, the virus wins out and it kind of settles out at a preset level. And it will stay at that level in contrast to HIV, which eventually, after many years, will take off. The other things uh, that will then show up is the ALT after about seven weeks will start to flare. Sometimes you will get symptoms like jaundice, uh, and then after about 10 weeks, then the antibody becomes positive. This is an example of a patient who actually clears it. So it takes around um, eight to 16 weeks before clearance in most patients. And in my experience, those people who get symptoms are more likely to to actually clear it. So if they're getting jaundice, getting high ALTs, that's actually a good sign. Um, if they haven't cleared it by like week 16, then that's when we typically want to jump in with treatment. Okay. So this is a slide of the natural history of, of hepatitis C. In contrast to HIV, where most people who get exposed to HIV, they go on to get, go on, get chronic, there are a good number of people, 15, maybe as high as 30%, who can actually fight off the hep C on their own. Uh, the ma vast majority will go on to get chronic or persistent infection. And then of those, around 1 in 5 or 20 percent are susceptible to getting cirrhosis. This is a slow process. If you're HIV negative, it usually takes two to three decades. Uh, but if you have HIV, and particularly HIV, and also drinking a lot, that time course can be much shorter, um, on the order of maybe 10, 10 years. I think there's some examples of it being as short as five years. So that's very important if a person's co-infected that um, they be evaluated more closely. So what we're trying to do with treatment is really to head off cirrhosis, okay? That's why it's uh, highlighted there in the red arrow. Because once you develop cirrhosis, that's when bad things happen. Uh, a cirrhotic has an annual risk of 3% a year mm -hmm. of getting end-stage liver disease and an annual risk of 4% for liver cancer. And liver cancer is an incredibly aggressive cancer with very um, poor prognoses. So this slide uh, is an old slide from um, researchers in France. And, and what it shows is that patients who are HIV positive, highlighted here in the yellow line, progress more rapidly in terms of liver fibrosis compared to their HIV negative colleagues in the green and pink arrows. <laughs> So that's why in an HIV negative patient with Hep C, we might do a biopsy every four to five years. In an HIV positive, we do them uh, typically more frequently, maybe every two to three years, because we know this can sometimes progress rapidly. So I mentioned the liver biopsy. Um, it is the best way, even now in 2012, to assess the amount of scarring. The blood tests show me how much inflammation there is. They tell me what kind of synthetic function, but there's no really good test for fibrosis. And uh, we've done, I think, over 10,000 liver biopsies at this point. Um, we've never had any fatal complications. We have them done by interventional radiology as well as by hepatology. They usually will have a local anesthetic uh, over the, the site. And the actual procedure takes one or two seconds to get a little right sized kernel of the liver. Then goes to a pathologist who scores it from zero to four. Uh, with four being the worst amount of, of scarring. I just want to point out there are other things that you can get on the liver biopsy besides fibrosis. You can get a sense of how much fat there is, and uh, it helps us to sometimes sort out the etiology of the fibrosis. Uh, so this is a, a cartoon of, of uh, the various stages of fibrosis, and this is what is called the triad. So there's a bile duct, a vein, and an artery, and the kind of white fibrous uh, tissue there is scar tissue, so stage zero, there's, there's basically nothing. And as you go to stage one, there's a little bit more. Stage two, a little bit more. And stage three, you'll actually have a bridge of scar tissue from the triad here to, to um, the vein over here. So um, that uh, is something that the pathologist will pick up. We often call stage three pre cirrhosis because a large proportion of those people, if untreated, will go on to stage four or cirrhosis. So in general, when we talk about treatment, we're really trying to, to get these folks here in stage three and four uh, first before we um, get on to treating the, the uh, less severe cases in stage zero to two. 
Uh, so um, one of the big issues with hepatitis C is that um, this has been a virus that's been incubating in many patients for decades, and it's a problem that's now finally coming home to roost. So this is, a, a, I think, a mathematical model that was presented by Gary Davis and then um, represented by Ira Jacobson and others, showing that in um, 2000, there were around 60,000 people with decompensated cirrhosis. <coughs> in 2010, that exceeded the 100,000 mark, and uh, that, that uh, number is going to continue to go up to around 2030 and then eventually start to taper off. But with that number going up, we'll see more patients with liver cancer in green and more patients with liver-related deaths. So basically about a doubling to a tripling in that uh, 10 to 20 uh, time, time period. So the key take-home points from today's talk is that hepatitis C transmission is relatively low, but many patients were uh, infected a long time ago and, and are yet to be diagnosed. In fact, it's probably as high as 75% of people walking around with hep C don't know they have it. Hepatitis C testing is becoming more important, and there's um, uh, this new recommendation by the CDC to use the birth cohort screen strategy. So if it's be born between 45 and 1964, they need at least a one-time antibody test. The role of liver biopsy is changing. Um, it's the, still the most reliable test, but there are some non-invasive markers that um, are showing uh, some promise. And especially as the treatment gets easier, uh, we may be doing fewer and fewer liver biopsies, and we can talk a little bit more about that. And lastly, uh, hepatitis C-related morbidity and mortality is increasing uh, both for our HIV-negative population, but also in our HIV-infected population. And uh, we're just on the upswing on that. We've got another probably 10 to 20 years of increasing numbers before we're going to see it to go down. So uh, I think in the coming months or weeks, we'll be talking about uh, HCV therapeutics for our HIV-positive, HCV-infected patients.